Hi, I'm Rob King. Welcome to the Homebrew Master Plan. And today we have a retrospective on the Olympics inspired Cloninburg 2024. Wow, the aroma is still very strong. Definitely got those earthy notes. It smells delicious. Let's give it a try. Here we are a month later. Flavour is still great. Nice and cold, I prefer it that way. But it still has that lovely flavour. It is missing some je ne sais quoi. However, it is still very, very drinkable. In this retrospective, we will look at the lessons learned. We'll also pick up the vital statistics, the schedule, and of course, the cost, including the price per bottle. But before we get into all of that, let's pick up the story from the grain to glass recipe that we finished off with the Frankenstein's Clonenberg as we moved from the barrel to the keg to see if we could get some extra carbonation. Let's have a quick look how that all turned out. Well, it's been a couple of weeks since we put this in the mini keg. The pressure was a bit high, but I didn't turn it down. I thought we'll just go with that. Touch on the carbonated side. So we do seem to have another Frankenstein's monster that has worked. Jammy though I am. So, hope you can see there, carbonation, lovely. I do like a bit of carbonation and that is there. Um, I think it's more to do with the fact that the uh, pressure was very high and I always have fun with this little party tap. Um, so, Plenty of foam. Um, taste, still very similar. I think I got away with the oxidisation problem, or you know, avoiding the oxidisation problem. I've been really, really enjoying this one. I really do wonder what it would have been like with those extra malts um, that I missed. I'm going to do this one again at some point and actually do the recipe correctly. Well, Moving into the mini cake was a bit of fun. A couple of pints extra. Cheers everyone. Like and subscribe and thank you very much for watching. Cheers. By lucky chance then, it all worked out brilliantly. So let's move on to re-evaluation. Now, it has been a whole month since we popped open that first bottle. And so what is it like? Here we are a month later, I have a few bottles left. Carbonation is still good. Aroma, amazingly, is still very strong. Lots of earthy notes, a bit of pine in there. So all is good. Taste-wise too, it has remained a very light mouthfeel. Very smooth, very quaffable. Nice little kick on the end. This was a very clear, nicely carbonated, white head, perfect drink. Very nice indeed. Let's start then with the schedule. This is basically a lager. So we're gonna go through fermentation, carbonation, and lagering phase. We spent 21 days in fermentation, 27 days then carbonating, and then the final 34 lagering. And the end result was a very clear, carbonated, refreshing drink. Schedule was good. In total then, the schedule just short of three months.
Moving along then to the vital statistics, it will come as absolutely no surprise that the brew house efficiency on this one, which was estimated at 65%, came out at 55%. That was singularly due to the fact that I forgot to put 700 grams of grain into the brew. If you want to see all of the chaos, do check out the link above. Similarly then, the original gravity, the final gravity and the ABV all came out below the expected value, giving us an ABV of 3.8% versus a target of 5.4%. However, the in the bottle volume, possibly for the first time ever, came out above expectation, so we had 8.3 litres that hit the keg and the bottle. I'm happy with that win for something that was this tasty in the end. Moving along to costs then, this came in at £23.20 and the four most important ingredients make up the bulk of those costs. The grains came in at around £9, the water around £5, yeast just over £4 and then finally the hops came in at £2.75. They are the four key ingredients and therefore they are what you expect to spend most of your money on. Honey came in then at 80 pence, that was one of the boil additions. So in total, how does that 23 pounds and 20 pence break down when it comes to cost per bottle? If you're a classic, how much for a pint? It's one pound 58. However, if you're more metricized, then my barrel of five liters, that was 13 pound 92. Uh, for a typical 500 milliliter glass, which this is actually a 500 milliliter glass um, and a 500 milliliter bottle that you saw me opening at the start, that would be £1.39. Um, and for a smaller 330 bottle, that's 92 pence. Or for a larger 750, which you probably wouldn't find in a beer, just come in at just over £2. So this was a good value drink. Now included in those costs is the 700 grams of floor malted bohemian pilsner that I didn't actually use. I'll find another use for those in the future. For this recipe we have a top 10 countdown for lessons learned. Lesson number one then, read the recipe numbskull. Yes, I am referring to myself there. Um, if I had read the recipe and put in the 700 grams of additional floor malted bohemian pilsner, who knows what I would have been saying now. However, lesson number one, read the recipe. Lesson number two then is Irish Moss, another lesson learned, which is I have historically been using quite a high amount of Irish Moss. It turned out that actually I just needed far less. So this recipe did include only two grams of Irish Moss and the clarity was still great. Um, I do think I have been overdosing my previous recipes with Irish Moss. Two grams for this size of recipe was perfect. Lesson number three then is all about the hops, the strissel spout, the French hops, and this strong local demand for this particular hop. So I was glad to be able to buy it for my recipe. The elements of this hop that are important, this is a continental hop aroma, subtle and spicy notes, herbal and floral aroma with an undercurrent of citrus and fruit. So some of those earthy notes I picked up actually come more from the malt than from the hops. Um, the undercurrent of citrus, just very light. It definitely is spicy, I do get that. Just a really successful French style lager, cheers. Lesson number four then was my cooling in the fridge method, fail. Yes, I managed to warm up my fridge rather than cool down the wort. Ho oh, hum, lesson learned. So what I should have done really was cool it down as far as I practically could with the normal chiller and then just go the last mile in the fridge. It was worth a try. Lesson number five, and maybe I regret this lesson, was cheating the total volume. So the total volume of my Aldi Mould wine warmer is 15 litres, but it all added up to just a smidge over that. So I just winged it and added the extra 200 millilitres, just overloading it a little bit. Do I regret this now? Mm, 
I think I might. It, this was the beginning of the end. Did I overload my Aldi more than my warmer? And is that the reason why in the next brew, things did not go so well? Watch out for that lesson. Lesson number six then is the calculated strike temperature. And I always find the strike temperature calculates a bit high in the software. And I always knock off a couple of degrees in practice. I don't find once you add the grains that it changes that dramatically. So in this recipe, a mash temperature of 67 degrees, I find 68 degrees was fine as a strike temperature, but the suggested temperature was 70 degrees centigrade. Lesson number seven is the refractometer. Now I've had the refractometer as a lesson in the last few homebrews, mostly for getting used to how to use it. This one is slightly different. I took a refractometer reading 15 minutes into the brew and it came out ridiculously high. It was 1.041. This is completely inexplicable. Why was the reading so high so early in the brew when actually, you know, later on it was much lower than that when it finished? Bit of a mystery, to be fair. Do comment. Lesson number eight is wart left over. Now that's a tragedy, let's face it. But the reason is, I think, because of those lacks of grains. There would have been some absorption in those missing grains that would have reduced the volume a little bit and we would have come out about on target of what we were looking for. That's not just about volume, of course. It would have also bought up the original gravity to closer to the point that we were looking for. So, so I think it was a combination of the lack of grains in the brew that caused that excess wart. Lesson number nine then is the maturing barrel. I like this idea, but I'm still getting used to it. Now on this occasion, it just did not carbonate as well as I would have hoped. And you know, first challenge is you have to use only 18 grams of sugar. So it's lower than the nine grams per liter that I use for normal bottling. I wonder if the answer then is for the barrel, I do need a little shot of yeast to give it a bit of a boost to be able to carbonate. I don't think it was a leak because I think that that sealed up quite nicely, but it just did not carbonate as well. The other possibility, and I don't know if this has an effect, is there wasn't sufficient headspace. There was only a very small amount of headspace I left in the barrel. Should I have left more to create more CO2, to create more pressure and build it that way? I'm not sure exactly why, but the barrel was not as successful as the bottle. Lesson number 10 though, it was still a successful homebrew. Wow, so resilient. So we still got a great result, but this was not an Olympic medal winner. It was more of a good contender. Thanks for watching everybody. Please do like and subscribe. Do check out some of my other videos, including the outtakes from this video and also some new brews coming up, all grain to glass, all step by step. Cheers everyone, good health. The homebrew master plan has passed the halfway mark with eight in the bag and seven to go. However, things have taken a turn for the worst and I'm already worried about two of the upcoming brews. Equipment failure, my wonderful Aldi Mood wine warmer, has gone to the great brew kettle in the sky. It's exciting here, isn't it?